uh, ESREF ILL uh, colloquium. Uh, before uh, introducing today's topic and uh, and speaker, uh, I draw your attention to forthcoming events. Uh, a little bit later in this month, there should be a colloquium by Lieberger from University of Wittfassesrand on paleoanthropology. And uh, later in June this year, we shall have a colloquium by Xavier Vienthal from CEA Grenoble on quantum computing. Uh, also, uh, uh, to all people attending on Zoom, uh, you can use the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask questions uh, for the discussion at the end of, 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 the, of the talk. Um, and so I then come to uh, today's topic. So uh, with the advent development of the extremely brilliant source at ESRF, we have a considerable increase of of flux and these together with um, the development and use of uh, uh, new new detectors of very high throughput, then uh, ESRF beamlines produce a very, very uh, impressive amount of data that uh, was uh, starting to become a very serious bottleneck for the uh, use of ESRF. And that's why uh, ESRF has uh, decided to create a group uh, dedicated to uh, uh, data analysis that uses a lot of uh, uh, machine learning. And uh, we, um, we, we then thought it would be very good to uh, introduce machine learning to uh, the broad scientific community of ESRF and other institutes of the EPN campus. And, um, and that's why uh, we're glad to have today as a speaker, uh, Professor James Crowley from uh, Grenoble Institute Polytechnique at Université Grenoble Alpes. Um, James Crowley uh, studied in the US and, and then uh, came to Grenoble in, um, uh, in the mid uh, 80s and uh, has been in Grenoble uh, since, so he did uh, all of his career. Uh, here uh, is an expert of, um, of computer vision multimodal interaction robotics. And he was um, the head of the, of the group of uh, pervasive interaction at INRIA in, and uh, in, 19, uh, in 20, uh, 2019, he was uh, the appointed the head of the collaborative intelligence system at the uh, Grenoble App uh, Multidisciplinary AI Institute, MIE. And, um, he has received a number of uh, scientific distinctions. In particular, uh, he was uh, appointed a scientific member of the Institut Universitaire de France. And uh, in uh, 2014, I was uh, named uh, Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite. Uh, the talk of of James today will be entitled The Emergence of Machine Learning as a Rupture Technology for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, James, the floor, the floor is yours, and we are eager to listen to your presentation. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. You should see it now. Very good, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, yes, uh, in discussions with Patrick uh, in choosing the topic for this, um, Patrick indicated that, that it would be good to have a historical perspective about machine learning. And, and as someone who's been around for a long time and who lived through a lot of this, um, I was able to put together a story of, of what I experienced. It's a personal story. Um, I've got some math in there. I hope that's okay. Five of the slides have some equations. Um, there's really a backstory to the math and you don't need to read, read the equations. You can just listen to the words and hear the narrative that goes behind it should be okay. Um, so as Patrick mentioned, um, I very recently retired in October and I'm currently Professor Emeritus from Grenoble BMP. That means that I am no longer allowed to teach students, but that I can have more free time to do research, which is actually not such a bad situation. Um, basically, what I want to talk about is the following. Um, a scientific community devoted to artificial intelligence was created in the 1950s. After a euphoric period in the 1980s, AI was declared dead. However, since 2010, the popular media are increasingly claiming 
that we're in an AI revolution. And in fact, there are a lot of signs that that could be true. There's a lot of new products that are coming online. So what, what changed between 1980 and 2010? How did this dead failed science suddenly emerge to be such an earth shaking human? That's basically the message of the next 50 minutes. So what I wanna do is review in a little bit the evolution of AI from a pre-paradigm science into a more mature, not quite mature, but more mature science, and zoom in on uh, one particular technique called the perceptron um, that enables neural networks and how we can use that as a universal function approximation Talk about how that can be used for things like uh, object detection and images, um, signal understanding, et cetera, with deep learning. Then, then talk about generative networks and autoencoders. And the current revolution that's emerged in the last three or four years are about transformers that have become possible because of that. And say a few words at the end about what happens next, where I think we'll go with that. But first, let me start by talking about intelligence. What do we mean by intelligence? There, there's not a complete consensus of what this means. But I think Turing gave us a pretty good definition. It's a behavioralist definition. Turing um, posed a test. Um, he said that if a human sitting in a terminal interacting with another agent that he couldn't see, couldn't tell whether it was a computer program or another human, then the program could be considered to be intelligent. Right? So it's human level performance at text-based text interaction. Well, nowadays, nowadays we've uh, got tools that allow us to go beyond just interaction with text. We can start building systems that show human level performance of things like perception, action, communication, or interaction. So essentially what we're going to set as a bar for appreciating that a system and its behavior within an environment can be considered intelligent. And that is human level performance. Um, as some people in the field know, there are areas where you can go well beyond human level performance and others where we can't quite match the needs. But that's, but that's, but that's, that's, that's stuff and solving hard problems. Um, as a scientific discipline, AI really traces its roots to a seminar or a symposium at Dartmouth in 1956, where a lot of the early pioneers all got together and decided to create a field. Um, it was a multidisciplinary field. We had people like Arthur Samuel, who had a, a checkers playing game that learned from its mistakes. So it learned to play checkers by playing checkers. Uh, John McCarthy, who organized the seminar but, and gave us the LISP programming language, but also um, drew, drove AI into a uh, logic domain, insisted that anything that was intelligent had to be formalized as symbolic logic. Marvin Minsky, um, who gave us the frames representation and other knowledge representations that underlie much of cognitive science. Herb Simon, who came from psychology and economics, won a Nobel Prize in economics for his uh, combination of psychology and, and e economics. And Alan Newell, who uh, was often considered the, the father of modern planning. Um, these guys and uh, another 10 or so other scientists all got together at Dartmouth and spent a week, um, actually a few weeks if I remember correctly, trying to hash out what it would take to create a scientific discipline for artificial intelligence. Okay, Drawing from cognitive science, logic, planning, pattern recognition, image processing, and other fields. One person they didn't invite was a guy named Frank Rosenblatt. Rosenblatt had this crazy idea of building this universal learning machine that would learn linear decision surfaces. He called it the perceptron. And the perceptron, well, he built one out of vacuum tubes, occupied a room. Uh, it had some problems. It could only classify patterns. That's all it did. Um, it only, in fact, was a binary classifier. It required labeled training data for supervised learning. And it required literally separable classes. You had to be able to put one class on one side of the surface and another on the other side. But if you had that, then it could learn to make any kind of decision. At the time, people even called it the electronic brain. Okay? The data had to be separable. Yeah, if the data weren't separable, the algorithm wouldn't terminate, which was kind of a nuisance. Um, the field went through a number of paradigms um, up, up till the 60s. Pretty much the literature was dominated by automata theory and pattern recognition, um, partly thanks to Newell and his influence and other others in California. The 
um, field moved into planning and problem solving in the 1960s, and that was an important aspect of the 1980s. Uh, expert systems emerged in the late 70s, and it was a real revolution, driving um, AI in general towards symbolic reasoning. And um, in fact, I was a graduate student back then in the late 1970s and early 80s, and was able to make a lot of money by teaching people expert systems and doing consulting. So it was very, very hot at the time. Um, however, by the mid 80s to 90s, we suddenly kind of hit a barrier and AI lost its steam and became um, somewhat almost disreputable. Other places wouldn't teach it anymore. In the 1980s to 2000s, it was dominated by logic programming, fear improving. Um, from 95 on, Bayesian methods and the semantic web both emerged. But all along, through all those paradigms, there were three fundamental barriers. Insufficient tr labeled training data for supervised learning, insufficient computing power, and the prohibitive cost of encoding domain knowledge. What do I mean? Well, take, for example, the expert system. Okay, this was the big hot thing in 1980. The idea was that a domain expert sat down with the software engineers and encoded the domain experts' expertise in a computer program along with an inference engine. And that gave us a system that an end user could use for consulting. Okay, the, the classic example was an antibiotic therapy advisor made by Ed Feigenbaum, 1980 at Stanford. Um, this works, but turned out to be prohibitively costly. Encoding domain knowledge by hand, something extremely expensive and, and actually not very practical. So this more or less killed the idea of expert systems. By 1990, no one talked about them anymore. And parallel, about the same time, a small group of people continued to experiment with the perceptron. And there was a wave of popularity around something called artificial neural networks. And the story at the time was that symbolic computing was to totally incapable of solving some very simple problems like driving a car, steering a robot, or recognizing an apple. And um, people showed that with relatively simple networks of perceptrons, you could do these things. Okay? And there were two main innovations that made it possible. One of them was not just having a single perceptron, which was shown to be quite limited, but having layers of perceptrons and using a soft decision surface. And the other was training the perceptron using a form of gradient descent training called backpropagation. This provided a simple and effective alternative to symbolic computing, which if it had been the dogma at the time, it just wasn't, wasn't working. So what do I mean? Well, the artificial neural network, the first thing that really made it practical compared to the perceptron was to replace the hard decision surface. Um, let me, no, I don't want to know if I, you can see my mouse. The hard decision surface um, with a soft sigmoid function, which was derivable. And this meant that we could use um, backpropagation, we could use gradient descent to come and try and tune the network parameters. Um, gradient descent actually used um, a number of labeled training data, M samples of data X with indicator variables for ground truth Y and essentially would tune the network parameters W and a bias B so that the network would make the optimal decision. And um, it was possible to reformulate gradient descent as a first order iterative optimization. It, it is, Gradient descent is the first order iterative optimization algorithm. We're just crunching through the data over and over until the parameters came to a minimum cost. Essentially, what we're doing is we're estimating a cost function C and, and trying to drive that cost function as low as possible by tuning or adapting the weights. Well, what's powerful about all this is that, well, if you express it by brute force, what you end up with is a series of recursive equations. You have the second layer of the network based on the first layer, the third layer, layer based on the second layer, et cetera, a big long recursive equation, but you don't need to compute it that way. You can break it up into a, simple, uh, a set of small linear equations and calculate it by propagating an active en activation energy through the network. This is called a Hebbian representation after a, a, a scientist named Hebb, who in the 1940s suggested we could do calculations as the human brain does. Okay. And this enables parallel computation. What it says is we can express the entire network as a single instruction, multi-data calculation 
and distributed over a large array of parallel elements. So instead of having to do one um, recursive equation, we could do a large number of small equations. Um, this forward propagation of activation energy can also be used for back propagation for implementing gradient descent. And let me show an example. Okay, this I promise there aren't gonna, there won't be that many mathematical equations here, but I'm going to do two right now, uh, two or three pages of, of equations. So consider this really simple network with two neurons. Okay, we've got a first neuron that takes an input x, multiplies it by w, and adds a bias, and takes that output, puts it into a second neuron where it's multiplied by w two, again added bias, um, take it through a nonlinear decision, and then put an output. That, would be a recursive equation, except we're going to do this, of course, with uh, propagation of activation energy. The gradient of a cost function C tells us how much we need to adapt each of the weights in the network in order to drive that cost down to zero or as small as possible. So we'll set up a cost function, which is just least squares error, calculate the derivative, and that'll tell us uh, for each, each of the terms, the, the derivative of the cost with respect to each of the parameters tells us how much to adapt that parameter. And that can be computed, of course, with a chain rule, but it's a big, hairy recursive equation again. So we've got this big, long chain rule in order to get the weights, in order to get the correction errors back to each of the weights. But we can break that down into a backwards flow of a correction energy, just as um, the forwards flow, the activation, the for feed forward network propagated an activation energy through the network from left to right. We then take the error that we got at the output and then propagate that back right to left as a correction term and essentially breaking up that big long chain rule into lots of little equations, recursively calculating an error term delta, um, a delta for the second neuron from the output delta a delta from the first neuron from the second neuron, and propagating that back through the network. So we can turn the learning phase also into a big single instruction multi-data calculation that we can put in parallel. Okay. Uh, this is the general form of those equations. Um, as we have to sum up errors from all of the um, outputs, but uh, it's a little messier because that's the network. But essentially what that says is we can break down the training network, just as we did to the calc forward calculation, as propagation of energy. We can propagate energy from left to right to go in and then propagate error back, back out. And all of this on large parallel computing. Um, however, however, um, that sounds great when you've got a simple network, but in reality, um, to do anything useful, you need a very large network and a very large collection of data. So it requires massive computing with massive data. Uh, back in the 80s, we were talking about thousands of parameters. Uh, in, their, in the early 2000s, we were talking about hundreds of thousands. And today, we're talking about hundreds of millions of parameters in the network. Plus, we're training with very, very large data sets that are very noisy. That means our objective function is not this nice little concave quadratic that we saw a minute ago, but it, a kind of um, surface with lots of local minima. And our data set is a kind of liquid that's flowing over that surface. And what we're trying to do is to get that liquid to flow down to a local minimum in cost. And that'll be the best set of network parameters for whatever function we want. So this turned out to be pretty handy in the 90s, in the 80s, because it enabled us to do some um, otherwise impossible things with computer vision and with robotics. However, there were some problems. Uh, for one, it was uh, unexplainable. It was a black box. You train it with some data, but you never quite got the same behavior. You train the same network with the same data and you get random things out. Um, most of the time it worked as long as the graduate student who built it was standing next to it. The graduate student graduated, the network no longer worked. Very difficult to reproduce, reproduce results. And the cost of learning grew exponentially with the number of layers and the number of neurons. So that kind of led the community to abandon a second time neural networks. By the late, 90, by the late 80s and early 90s, there were very few people still working on this. So the people in machine learning basically abandoned it 
uh, for more sound Bayesian machine learning techniques. Uh, at that time also, there was a big schism in machine learning between people trying to do symbolic computing and learning for symbolic computing and people trying to do numerical computing. And in fact, that schism and that infighting in the community was one of the things that led the larger community to sort of declare that machine learning had died, had failed. I remember the European Commission at that time had a network of excellence that did fail and they actually stopped the project and stopped the funding. Three fundamental barriers, insufficient training data, insufficient computing power, and the prohibitive cost of encoding domain knowledge. So what's changed? Well, we've come, we've come to overcome those barriers. Insufficient training data, well, what we've got now is planetary scale data from the internet and the World Wide Web. We've also got realistic simulations. If you can build a very realistic simulator, you can train from the output on it and learn about phenomena and learn to recognize the phenomena um, with much, much less computing that it took to simulate the network. Now, for example, weather. You can, you can have um, neural networks that are recognize and detect phenomena in a weather pattern um, that don't require to simulate in great detail all the, all the uh, underlying physics. Insufficient computing power. Well, Moore's law finally caught up. Um, we, we saw GPUs, graphical processing units, uh, arrive in the around 2005, 2006 area. And, and gradually it become available, became available massive parallel computing. And that allowed us to attack the problem of encoding knowledge with generalized deep learning. Using massive parallel computing and massive planetary scale data, we can start to get some pretty good results with deep learning with very deep networks. Well, what really triggered the revolution um, was the following. Um, back in the 1990s, uh, one of the persons who kept out neural networks and didn't give up was a French guy named Yann Lacun. And Yann, unfortunately, because he, was doing, he did a PhD on neural networks, couldn't get a post in France. They ended up in New York teaching computer science um, at City College. But on the side, he kept playing with his networks and, and using them for small, simple computer vision problems. And in particular, he went after the problem of recognizing handwritten numbers using a data set provided by the National Bureau of Standards, now known as NIST. Um, and he won the competition and, and produced a network uh, based on a number of innovations called a convolutional network. Um, he, he did a variety of these, one of them his number five network actually won the competition in 1994 and was later uh, actually used to implement machines for reading checks and also for reading postal codes on, on envelopes for the post office. However, he couldn't publish. The people in computer vision and machine learning just didn't want to hear about it. Neural networks, failed science, doesn't work. Um, one of the innovations he had, and I need this box to explain some of the slides I'm going to show in a second, was to replace, um, first of all, to replace calculation over the entire signal with calculation over a small window. Okay, that's called a convolutional network. And what that does is greatly reduce the number of parameters that you need to learn because you're only learning a few weights for the window and greatly augment the amount of training data because now you could, every small window in your image, for example, becomes a training sample. The other thing he did was to have not just one receptive field, at each position, but multiple receptive fields, multiple small receptive fields. When you see a box like this here, um, what the third dimension of that box indicates is, is a, what we call the depth. And it's the number of different receptive fields learned at each position. Um, one of his colleagues, Alex Krzyznitsky, and his PhD advisor, Jeff Hinton, continued to play with networks like this. And in 2012, won by a very large competition, the large scale visual recognition challenge. Essentially what this was, was a yearly challenge where, where computer vision scientists had put images next to each of the words in WordNet and then challenged people to recognize the word that goes with each image. So it was a small image recognition task. Um, up until 2011, was pretty much, it was often dominated by people at either Oxford or uh, Grenoble. 
the Lear um, Xerox research team here in Grenoble, also the, the Xerox research team INRIA here in Grenoble. Um, in 2012, Alex Net won the competition dramatically, greatly reducing the error rate. And at that point, the computer vision community woke up and noticed that there was something. And from that point on, in 2013 and early 2014 on, the computer vision conferences started to be dominated by people using convolutional neural networks. One of my favorites um, was proposed by my colleague Andrew Zisherman at Oxford uh, called VGG, just named after his group, the Visual Geometry Group. Um, and it's a, uh, a very logical collection of very small windows. The innovation here was to use extremely small receptive fields and organize them in a very natural way. And this turns out to be a, a kind of workhorse for recognition. This, you can train this on an image net and then adapt it to almost any domain. It's very reliable for transfer learning. Um, another really interesting innovation of all this is something called YOLO. You only look once. And this poses the object detection problem as a single parallel regression, finding where an object is and what it is just by labeling small windows. And I mentioned this because it's an, a simple network, but it's also something that ST Microsystems is putting into uh, an ASIC right now. And so I understand that ST plans to actually commercialize a chip that does YOLO and something you can put um, in any camera or any, any kind of, uh, well, your cell phone. Um, so all this is great for detecting things, but it's not the only thing you can do with these deep networks. Just as we can use networks for discrimination, we can also use them to generate patterns. So the networks were originally invented for discrimination and detection, but we can also use them to generate patterns. We can generate natural sound and speech, natural language, synthetic images, robot animation, and we can make deep fake, realistic talking heads, for example. And the key to this is something called the autoencoder. Well, the audio encoder um, actually uses uh, a network like this to generate a clean code for a no from a noisy input. Okay. It learns to reconstruct or generate clean copies of the data. And what's interesting is it, it can work with unsupervised learning. It doesn't require label training data. The training data is the target. The error between the reconstruction and the original image is the cost function. And it's just going to drive the weight so as to minimize that cost function, squeezing it down through a kind of code. Now, initially, the autoencoder was used back in the 1980s as a, a way of generating, or as a way of experimenting with backpropagation. We recall Jeff Hinton couldn't find labeled training data to work out the backpropagation algorithm. So he just used the reconstruction problem, um, essentially doing a form of principal components analysis. This is really great because when you look at the principal components analysis equation, they require matrix inversion. So that limits the size of the data you can work with. But if you formulate that as a heavier network, well, you can, you can use any size network just as long as you have enough data, as long as you have enough computing power. So the autoencoder, essentially what we do, um, we're going to add to the cost function, reconstruction error, plus a sparsity term that tries to force um, each of these um, code elements to be independent of the others. So that if I put uh, numbers in here, I'll have a code for one, another code for two, and another code for three. And if I put in a noisy two, um, what I'll get out is a clean two on the other side. I learned to generate a clean copy. And when I look at the code vector, one of the elements is lit up and all the others are zero. The data is forced to a sparse coding uh, using information theory. Uh, we can do some really interesting things with this. You know, one of them is the variational audio autoencoder. Um, normally, the autoencoder learns discrete classes, but if we do this properly, we can learn probabilities and represent them as mean and standard deviation and use them to reconstruct um, small imagets that look like the original image. For example, in this case, I can animate a dancer um, who may or may not have clothes on with a, a Clothes dancer, I can put in one person dancing and show another person doing the same dance moves. Um, same thing with talking. I can put in one person talking here and show another person saying the same thing here. 
And in fact, it's used that way for deep fake. And with a techni technique like this, you can generate um, an image of someone talking um, animated by someone else talking. And the lip movements and the face expressions are the same, but it's not the same face. Another thing you can do is put a discriminator as a judge to a generator and have the two compete with each other. The generator trying to fool the discriminator and the discriminator trying to tell when the generator is fooling. And each, each time one or the other makes an error, it, it, it refines the weights of the first. So this actually um, has been used for, for, to learn. And, and what's, what's amazing about this is you can continue running it um, as long as you've got computing. So you basically set up these two systems fighting each other and each one correcting the other. And as long as you keep, keep throwing computing power at it, it just keeps getting better and better at realizing deep fake images or realistic speech synthesis or realistic images. But there's another thing this autoencoder allows us to do. And that's what we call self-supervised learning. Essentially, this is a form of unsupervised learning where once again, the data is its own ground truth. And what we train the network to do is to replace missing parts and to predict the next output called missing token replacement and next token prediction. In missing token replacement, if I've got missing parts of the letter two here, for example, <laughs> it'll fill them in. Um, if I have a word and I garble one of the letters so that you can't see that letter, but you see the other letters, you can essentially reconstruct the missing letter from the context. Um, if I have speech and I mispronounce a word, I can reconstruct the mispronounced syllable or the mispronounced word from the context to word. I can use this to learn context and reconstruct. The next thing I can do is associate the next output. So if I have a numerical sequence, one, two, I can learn to expect three. Um, I can do this with number sequences, of course, but I can do it pretty much with any signal, is learn to predict what's coming next. And I can do that with text, et cetera. And I can do it over time <coughs> and at multiple levels of abstraction. So one of the things that this has been used for is encoding text. So for example, we could take the text, this is a phrase, and train it by masking out parts of this is a phrase. So this a phrase, this is phrase, et cetera, and have the system replace the missing part, put an output, which is the complete phrase. But we can also have it take individual words, put them all together and spit out a sentence. We can take individual letters, put them all together and spit out a word. We can take sequences of sentence and spit out a paragraph. And from that, abstract a kind of code meaning which encodes the signal that came in. We can capture the meaning of a word or the meaning of a sentence, et cetera. Um, these are called recurrent networks. Um, the, most of the tools for recurrent networks are extremely expensive to compute and very unstable, but, but the technology has been making some rapid progress. One of the interesting innovations that emerged from these kinds of networks was the use of something called attention. With attention, essentially what we do is we can take those latent variables, those code vectors from previous times, and we can attach a kind of key for looking them up associatively, and then put in a query, and just by matrix multiplication or by activation, by Hebbian calculation, go back and associate a current um, uh, hidden code vector with previous code vectors in a sequence and learn which parts of the sequence were relevant. This is called attention um, and, and has turned out to be a major revolution for, for first of all, text and natural language, and more recently for all of machine learning. In particular, in 2017, people at Google showed that you could stack sequences of the encoders together to get more and more abstract representations from a signal and look at them with attention from a sequence of decoders to get back to the original kind of signal. And this is what's well, widely used for um, things like internet search, but also for machine language translation. And if you go to Google Translate, this is the way Google Translate works or deep L. In fact, there, there are stories of graduate students who, um, German graduate students who, who write their doctoral thesis in poor low-class German, 
translate it to English with DeepL and then translate it back to German and get high class German um, using this kind of technology. Essentially, attention associate words in a sentence in order to provide context. And when you do this with words, typically, or with a sentence, you typically have multiple heads that look at different aspects of the sentence, the verb, the subject, the object, modifiers. And, and you can get multiple contexts that way to associate the words. Um, tokens associated with self-attention um, really have become the dominant approach in the last few years for natural language processing. But they're also turning out to be extremely useful for multimodality because we can associate with words with images. We can learn that a bowl has a certain shape and look for that shape and we see the word bowl. We can look for pink. We can look for yogurt. We can look for other food, type, food types using essentially self-attention as an association mechanism. Um, and this has started to replace um, deep networks and uh, in particular started to replace convolutional networks and recurrent networks for things like speech recognition and computer vision. In fact, there's a shift underway in my own field, computer vision right now towards more and more the use of transformers. One particular architecture that I think is really cool that showed up last year here in Grenoble was the episodic transformer, which essentially associates what a robot is doing now, not just with the spoken commands and with the goals it's trying to accomplish in the computer vision, but with what it did in the past. So you have essentially a, a history of the robot operations associated with the current operation, associated with what the robot currently sees and is trying to do. So what happens next? Where do we go from here? Well, um, as uh, Niels Bohr said, um, predictions are always difficult, especially about the future. Or, or was it Yogi Berra who said that? Or maybe it was Mark Twain. It's one of those quotes that lots of people um, are, are associated with. So really the question is what domains are most suitable for economic and societal rupture from AI technologies? Well, Kai Fu Li, um, who was one of my colleagues as a graduate student, and he's now gone back to China and taken a high position in China, wrote a book a few years ago uh, called AI Superpowers. And in that book, his slogan was, AI is the fire, data is the fuel. If you want to predict innovation from AI, work for the data. And in, the, in that book, uh, Kai proposed five waves of rupture from innovation with AI. Um, his first wave was the internet AI and AI as a service. And this is pretty much happening now especially with the emergence of GPT-3 and, and BERT and others, uh, people are waking up to the idea that you can have massive computing using cloud computing, offering AI services online, and, and people can use those using the internet. The next wave, which he predicted, was enterprise AI. And it, it turns out that many corporations in America moved to digital records back in the 1980s and have uh, 30, 40 years of recordings of their activities all digital, stored, private, that they can data mine um, and use to optimize and streamline their operations and become more efficient. Um, another amazing source of data are mobile phones. Um, mobile AI using smartphones. And in fact, uh, mobile uh, smartphones in general are enormous vacuum cleaners for, for data. They produce prestigious amounts of data and associated with, uh, with uh, machine learning can learn an awful lot about a person, their context, and their activities. Um, from there, Kai predicted that we'll move more and more towards ubiquitous perception and interaction systems, you know, cameras that do face recognition in public, which we're already seeing too many of, um, and other devices where, where computer vision and AI sort of provide a gateway for services in public or in private. And from there, autonomous systems, things like self-driving cars, and, and home robots. And Kai argued that the US, China, and Europe were unevenly positioned to profit from each wave based on the availability of data, pointing out that uh, because there was no such thing as privacy in China, it was much easier to snarf up everybody's data from their cell phone and do machine learning on it. Uh, whereas much more difficult in Europe to do that, fortunately, 
Okay. Um, in the US, there's a much larger record of enterprise data, so you can do enterprise AI, et cetera. So this is the competition we in Europe are in right now. Okay. Um, my personal take on this um, is that when you talk about innovation with AI, remember this is human level performance at interaction. We can talk about interaction with people, interaction with the physical world, interaction with systems, and interaction with information. With people, we can talk about education, using AI for entertainment, for healthy living, interaction with the physical world for robotics, transportation, manufacturing, for systems with smart buildings, smart cities, smart roads, and with information in the form of a virtual personal assistant, for example, that can be your web agent and go with, find information for you on the internet, help you with travel planning, or help you with any kind of access to large body, bodies of, of uh, information. Um, for this, in our research team, we proposed three categories of interactive systems. We called them effectors, media, and advisors. Effectors inspire affection. Medias extend human perception and experience. And advisors propose courses of actions that are completely obedient. They don't act, they just advise. But effectors using a technique called reinforcement learning, which turns out to work very well with deep learning, can learn to recognize and inspire affection. And already this is done with some forms of elderly care robots. Um, such as the parallel robot that's on the right here. Um, and it's an active research area, learning how to see whether a system is pleasing somebody and learning how to adapt its behavior so that it's more pleasing or has a better effect. And of course, you can learn any kind of uh, emotional stimulation, including how to make somebody mad. Um, media, um, well, we saw currently with artificial, we've seen with uh, augmented reality technology, and we can display information that's pre-programmed, but we can go way beyond that. We can fuse the virtual with real. And I think this is what Meta, the previous Facebook company, is trying to get to. And combining AI and machine learning, where you overlay information with the, the real world, and uh, not just information, but also simulations of what can happen, projections of the future, projections of possibility. And, and um, well, the sky's the limit. What I'm really interested in right now are advisors using cognitive computing. The idea here is that we can take a domain uh, with a collection of textbooks or the internet, use, serving as domain knowledge, and use that to train a transformer in order to make a domain expert that can then advise the user. And be useful for questions like, what are the key references to read about such and such? Or has anyone published data on this phenomenon? Okay. Um, this is already becoming possible. There's a number of examples. OpenAI created a, a transformers-based system called GPT-3, which turns out to be extremely powerful. And, and among the things it's been used for is writing agents that can write their own computer code. Um, and they, they made it available to several thousand developers. Uh, one of them got a hold of it to build a digital copy of a lost friend. Basically, this uh, Russian computer scientist had lost her very close friend for which she had many years of email exchanges, um, et cetera. And she trained it to make a replica uh, of her friend. And she created a startup to do this and uh, put it online with a nice virtual rendering. And, and now it's a product and you can play with it and it takes on different personalities and it's really quite engaging. I mean, it, and it works to engage you and to please you. Um, and as I said, we can encode knowledge from any written source, textbooks, the literature, even the internet, to generate domain expert advisors, medical, for legal, for financial, for scientific. Okay. One of my dreams would be to use this for scientific literature for areas that are not my specialty, but which, for which I need to keep track of what's happening. Um, machine learning, for example, okay. where I could take the latest scientific publications, uh, put them on top of a pre-trained transformer that keeps up with them, and then I'll be able to ask questions like, um, uh, has anybody published anything new on such and such, or uh, what's the latest result? What's the best reference for such and such? Such an advisor would not discover new concepts, but it could provide a tool to augment human intelligence. 
which more or less brings me to, to what my current chair at the uh, um, AI Institute is on, the Collaborative Intelligence Systems. Collaboration is a process where two or more actors work together to achieve some shared goal. And what we're interested in is the case where one of the actors is a human and one of the actors is a machine. We'd like to have machines and people work each together, each enhancing the abilities and bringing in their unique abilities um, to, to build something that's to work on a common goal. Uh, for this, um, with our colleagues in the European network, we formulated a roadmap, which is a kind of layered roadmap of different sorts of abilities. Um, the challenge is to build systems. Well, we, we know at the reactive level, pretty much today, how to build natural language exchanges, how to have conversational agents, um, how to do that with vocal and with, with spoken language, as well as written text. Um, those systems are just starting to become aware of their situation. So we can take situation models from cognitive psychology and, and start to put some intelligence. And using the literature from the planning theory, we can do simple operations, um, making up plans to accomplish things. But we really don't know how to get a hold of the practical knowledge that people have, to be able to have human experts explain their expertise and procedures for how to get things done. And we're still far from being able to be really have systems that are really creative that can create new answers. So we've laid out this roadmap of increasingly difficult problems in a layered system, and we're looking at techniques at each of those different layers. So um, I know I, I realized I was speaking fast there for a while. Uh, we're coming right up on 50 minutes. So, so let me cut to the chase with some conclusions. Essentially, the messages were the following. Intelligence is human level performance at interaction, whether it's interaction with another human, physical world, systems, or information. Machine learning has revolutionized artificial intelligence. It's a rupture technology that made previous techniques obsolete. Machine learning is made possible by access to large volumes of data, planetary scale data and massive scale computing using graphical processing units, ter uh, tensor processing units and ASICs. And one of the big recent advances has been transformers, which are stacked autoencoders trained with self-supervised learning. Um, and they open up all recorded literature to artificial intelligence. Um, they can provide a technology for building effectors, things that influence our emotions, media, things that allow us to see things in a new way, and advisors, things that give us easy interactive access to information. And in general for AI, if AI is the fire, data, data is the fuel. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim, for the very uh, uh, comprehensive